Hello friends, welcome to my video as part of CoCovid 2020. I have said 2020 like there's going to be another one next year, which I hope there is. Hopefully by now you've seen a program for all the events that are happening this weekend, but if not, check out the link in the description box below. As a bit of background information, my name is Ash, my pronouns are they, them. I have at various times been a cosplayer, historical costumer, general sewing bean, and most recently I accidentally fell into the live action roleplay community and that's now where I spend most of my time. And this is Thursday, who is our emotional support cat and provides no other assistance and help for the channel whatsoever. Before you ask, yes, I have dressed up specially rather than just wearing my pyjamas like usual. Thank you for noticing. There's a lot of reasons you might want or need to design a new costume instead of copying an existing character, fashion plate or extant garment. Maybe you're a historical costumer and you want to make something entirely plausible but different from all the examples you've already seen. Maybe you're cosplaying a character from a book who only ever gets a written description. Or you've decided to do an original variation of an existing design. Maybe you're costuming a play or short film and you need to create the aesthetic of that production from scratch. Or you're doing what I do all the time, which is coming up with an original character, whether that's for LARP or a totally original project. Designing a costume can seem intimidating and it's really easy to just say, well, I'm not creative, I can't do this, that's a lie. You are creative, you can do this. And yes, the first time is gonna be tricky, but design is a skill. It is a skill you can learn and practice and your fifth, 10th, 100th version will be faster, cleaner, better than your first. You all have the capability to make wonderful things, things that no one else could make. You're here, you are creative, and you already have a lot of the skills that you need. And no, that doesn't include drawing. Sorry to anyone who thought this was going to be a drawing tutorial. Um, I can't draw. I'm terrible at figure drawing. There's a reason my house is full of abstract art. If drawing out of design is what helps you get it straight in your head, that's great. But in this house, you're already going to make it. You don't need a portrait as well. I have a lot of respect for the costumers who are also artists, but it's not an integral step for everyone. Speaking of steps, we have five. Brief, expand, research, edit, execute. Got it? Okay. Step one, the brief. In LARP or live action role play, the brief is like the bible of the game's look and feel. Good briefs are evocative, open, full of juicy details for you to dig into, but not overly specific, easy to execute, full of character, and above all, once you drill down to the bits that are just relevant for you, short. Examples would be Isolationist Dwarf Paladin in a Dying Fantasy World Mercenary Warlord on a Capitalist Dystopian Colony Ship High Fantasy Princess who volunteered on the front lines of a war with diesel punk airship pirates Student at an early modern military academy with a strong anime aesthetic A war soldier in a fantasy industrial revolution Whatever kind of costuming you're doing though, you have a brief It just might not be clearly spelt out for you in a document the way it is for a LARP game The brief is the what, when and where of your costume for a historical costuming event, you'll often find that they give you an idea of the era, a theme, a particular event, and then you can extrapolate your brief from this. Is it going to be daytime or evening? That's relevant for a lot of historical periods. Are you going to be outside? What gender and social class are you portraying? Examples here would be a female attendant at Henry VIII's court hunting trip, an upper-class woman's ball gown, 1890s, Regency day dress for a middle-class gentleman, peasant women in camp for a reenactment battle, English anarchy, anything pre-1939 and red or white for an afternoon tea and city tour. If you're costuming a character from a book, play or film script, you have an extra deep dive to do, because usually these details are not laid out quite so clearly. You might have to speak to the director about where and when they're planning to set the play, or go through the book with a fine-toothed comb looking for clues, colours, symbolism, or references to specific technologies that you can then research to try and establish what kind of era the book might be taking place in, even if it's a fantasy. When were waffles invented? We have to go deeper. And again, your brief might be as simple as taking an existing character design and 
adding your own spin on it. Even Lolita tea parties normally have some kind of theme that they encourage you to engage with in your coordinates. Whatever the event, whatever the reason for your costume, you have a brief. So you have a brief and it's just that, brief. It's short, it's succinct, it perfectly encapsulates your character and you have absolutely no idea where to go from here. Don't panic because we're about to move on to the point where we take that perfect minuscule encapsulation of everything that this character is and expand it. Step two, expand. Expanding the brief is just that, making it bigger and bigger and bigger until you have more than enough material to work with. How big will be down to personal tolerance and you'll get a feel for this the more you do it. Equally, how you store it is very much down to how you best work. Do you want to put it in a notebook or a scrapbook? Do you have a special file on your computer or a Pinterest board? Do you have a million open tabs that you never close? Don't judge me. I actually keep a lot of stuff just in my head. How my brain stores information makes that pretty reliable. Can I remember my own phone number? No. Do I remember what I was going to do today? Not a chance. Can I tell you where to find all the references relating to my next game, including specific blogs and page references and large research texts? Yes. And that worries me. However you decide to store it, it just needs to be accessible and easy. Easy to use, easy to add to. It doesn't have to be pretty. The goal here is to make the costume, right? Not a portfolio of how you got there. Unless you're a theatre or design student, in which case I'm so sorry and why are you watching this? I have no formal training. The point here is not to refine anything. If you have an idea, put it in the pile. Even if your thoughts then evolve away from it or you end up discarding it further down the line. If you have questions that don't have answers, put them in. If you've just seen this amazing movie or gone to this exhibition or read this book and there's this thing in it that you really like and you think that you just want to incorporate something, anything from it into what you're doing, just add that. More is more at this stage. Don't worry about things making sense or following on or working well together. We'll deal with that further down the line. Right now, we're just exploring how your ideas evolve. This is also the point where you want to ask lots and lots of questions. Is this going to be an indoor or outdoor event? Do I need more than one outfit? Am I going to need special undergarments? Is it going to be muddy, raining, cold? Where am I going to put my phone? Do I have to go outside? Am I going to have to change into this on my own? It's also the time to go off on tangents. Interrogate different aspects of the brief and see if there's a really obvious explanation or if you end up spiralling off somewhere weird and different than what anyone else might have thought of. Go down the rabbit hole. Join the dots in weird ways. Nothing needs to really make sense at this point. We're just collecting all the ideas that you have. Not every idea will be viable, but you won't know that until you've held things up to the light for a couple of days, and you might be surprised at what turns out is. There's really no limit on what you can include. Do you have a particular piece of fabric or trim in your stash that you want to use? Or an item of clothing or accessory that you think might work? In it goes. Have you started writing your character's backstory and it's full of all these juicy details that you can mine for character and accessory information? That's amazing. Have you started talking to your friend who's going to the same event and they've got different but equally cool ideas and you're starting to think about how your two costumes are going to look side by side and whether you're going to harmonize or contrast and what that says about the relationship between you two? Because that's awesome. Include all of it. Now, you don't actually have to spend a long time on this step, for me, it's quite a passive thing that happens in the background of other projects. I'll actually be working on the kit for next month's game, but planning five or six games in advance. So I might have pretty solid ideas for game two, but game five or six are still just percolating in the background. On the other hand, you might be on a deadline and have to get this out of the way in a really short space of time. And that's not bad. Some of my best work comes when I am on a strict deadline and under a lot of time pressure. It's really easy to procrastinate on this part and never get on to the next steps, but get some coffee and focus up because we are only on step two people. We have to keep going. Anyway, once you've acquired your small horde of images, ideas, concepts, links, patterns, and other bits and bobs, and you're hovering over it like a deranged kit goblin, it's time to move on to the next step, which is research. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think we were done adding to the murder board? No, my friends, we have to go deeper. The research stage is basically where you take 
all of the ideas you've had so far and look at them in more detail. Try and make them more concrete and plausible. The most obvious example is costume history, so I'm going to get that out of the way first. Obviously, if you're trying to be accurate-ish to a particular period, you may have started with your research and you're going to do a lot of it. But even if you're not, reading around costume history can be really, really valuable. Want to do a big bell skirt? There's a period for that. Weird shape sleeves, they've all been done before. Menswear that makes everyone's legs look amazing, got you covered. In short, you can cut so many corners by learning from the past. Insert political joke of your choice here. And even if it's something as simple as wearing a linen under tunic so your pretty much un unwashable velvet robe stays clean, history is full of lessons to be learned. And again, if you're playing with a setting that isn't based on a specific historical period, but has some very strong themes, like for example, naval warfare, dramatic moorlands, a intellectual and social revolution, colonialism, or even just a brooding hero. You can evoke this by looking at historical periods that are very closely associated with those themes in the public imagination. In this case, the Regency. I'm talking about the Regency. Other periods are available and better, fight me. You can also just use history for the shapes and techniques, which are many and varied and wildly useful. Aside from tried and tested solutions to problems you've only just thought of, there's whole decades and countries that are shockingly underrepresented to the point that even people who are a little bit into costume history will struggle to accurately place or identify them. And you already know that the shapes and proportions work, the patterns and designs are there for the taking. So you might look at pictures of a previous game and realise that your character, who is a total total outsider to all of the other characters currently in play would look really weird and out of place while not off brief if dressed in, for example, 17th century Dutch women's wear, which it just so happens there's a pattern of in the book that has recently come out and you've always wanted to make, to use a completely random example. Research. Even if you want to stay solidly in the fantasy and speculative side of things, there is also stuff to research. Say you want to portray a common fantasy species like an elf or a dwarf, or a really common trope like a wizard or a swashbuckling pirate. Looking at all the ways that kind of character has been portrayed in media can give you a lot of good ideas about stuff that you might want to do, or indeed stuff that you look at and go, N no, please no, never again. Deciding what you don't want to do can sometimes be as useful as deciding what you do. To go with, for example, the character of a dwarf, I found this incredible paragraph in the design book for the Hobbit movies, which were terrible, about how they created a very subtle trim effect on otherwise plain looking garments by laser cutting Celtic knotwork patterns into thick leather and sandwiching it between two layers of thinner leather. And I am sure as hell stealing that idea for something. You don't need to copy the costume exactly. You'll find all kinds of details like that where you go, yes, that is an incredible dwarfish, elvish, wizardy, whatever detail. And I can absolutely play on the groundwork that's already been done. You can research specific materials, specific techniques, specific processes, even something as simple as how would I get this effect on a costume? You can also research different countries. And you should. If in your collecting expanding phase, or even in the brief itself, you've picked up on something that belongs to another country or culture that you don't belong to, particularly if it's a non-European one, you should research the shit out of that. All of your other ideas can, in theory, be executed badly, but very few of them are likely to hurt people. Whereas if you take something from a culture that is not your own, regardless of how well you research it and how well you execute it, you can still cause harm to another human being. And it should probably go without saying that that's not okay. In spite of what many people writing in the incredibly white LARP community seem to think. If you're struggling to find resources for something, if it seems extremely important or spiritual, if you're not completely sure it's appropriate for the purpose for which you're using it, or you have even the slightest doubt whether or not 
this is something that's okay for you to wear, or you're not certain whether or not you're playing into at best unfortunate and at worst actively harmful stereotypes. Yes, I'm looking at you, every single game and setting that has explicitly Japanese coded aliens, just don't. There are so many wonderful and imaginative ideas out there, most of which are freely available for you to use. You don't have to research everything on your murder board. Yes, we are going to continue referring to it as a murder board because this is the visual image we're working with. But in fact, I'd say unless it was particularly linear or small, you probably shouldn't. Some things you'll touch on and then immediately find that actually this just isn't going to work and it's okay to drop it at that point. It might become obvious really quickly that some things are going to take way too much time to research, much too much time to execute, or are simply out of budget. They might just not work for this project anymore, and that's okay, you don't have to research everything. You just need enough to form a base to start with as we move on to the next step, which is edit. So it's time to move on to the penultimate step, editing. What we are going to do is we're going to take this beautiful mess of ideas and inspirations that you've painstakingly worked on and you're going to throw most of it away. That's right, kill it. Kill it all. Almost all. I mean, you have to keep some of it. For... Let's move on. It's now time to move on to the final design for the costume, which means that not everything that you've established, researched and expanded upon can or should be included. Before you send all your precious research babies off in a full Viking funeral, however, just because you're not using it in this costume doesn't mean that it was a waste of time. You can hang on to things for future costumes and future ideas that you might have. Nothing you've researched is wasted. Some things may even spiral off to become projects all of their own right, because that's completely fine and has never caused any problems for anyone ever. You might have fairly simple decisions to make. Two different inspiration bodices you have to choose between, or two different styles of coat that you both like and can kind of see how you can combine elements of the two into a new final version. Or you might have really vague ideas that need to be hammered into shape. You've got a colour scheme, but is the robe going to be lighter than the trousers or darker? What fabrics does it need? Are you going to use a belt? Will this coat work with the sleeves on that blouse? You want to incorporate this one trim somewhere, but where? How much trim is too much trim? Is there even such a thing as too much trim? Should you use more trim? Is there even enough trim in the world? When I'm working on a costume, I like to concentrate on three main elements. The silhouette, the colour scheme, and the level of detail. Yeah, I, I realise I'm doing steps within steps and that's not inherently very helpful, but work with me here. I never pretended my brain was linear. The silhouette is the shapes involved. If you were just an outline, what would you look like? Where is the costume broad and where is it narrow? What's the overall impression of the shape? Is it curvy or straight? Does it flow or is it rigid? Is it asymmetrical or unbalanced? And is that deliberate or not? Within the costume itself, if you break everything down into monochrome blocks, what's the overall impression you're getting of these different shapes working together? Are things staggered or do they all end at about the same level? Do you have lots of long, elegant pointing lines or short truncated ones? If you're struggling, go back to your murder board and look at some of your influences for general trends for shape and silhouette. Have you picked out lots of dropped waists, bell skirts, or long flowing layers? If you're trying to replicate a particular era, getting the silhouette right can help a lot, even if you then go on to use completely the wrong fabrics and level of trim. Whether it's an 1880s bustle or 1980s shoulder pads, that shape does a lot for people's brains to get them in the right kind of mindset. The colour scheme is kind of self-explanatory. What colours are you using? I tend to expand this out to things like patterns and textures too. There's all kinds of rules and charts and diagrams, websites and whole books that will help you come up with colour schemes that work. And honestly, colour would be a whole video in and of itself. They're mostly guidelines. If you want to wear horrifically clashing colours and prints because it makes you happy, do so with pride. If you're just starting out with colour schemes and have no idea where to start, I've got a couple of top tips that I keep in mind when putting something together. Black, white and red are neutrals. You can pair almost any colour with any of these three or use them as accents to jazz up an existing colour scheme. It's much easier to pick a dominant colour and have accents of a secondary colour than to try and balance equal amounts of two colours. When picking your colours, also think about their intensity and shade. If all of your colours are of equal intensity, the overall effect will be muddy or garish. Combining a more muted shade with a more brilliant one gives a much better effect. Colour, texture and pattern. 
Keep at least one the same, change the other two for contrast. Two different colours and a similar matte texture works very much the same as the same colour, one matte and one shiny. And as for patterns, generally speaking, unless you're going to match patterns exactly in different colour schemes, pair them with a solid or clash them very, very hard. A geometric pattern and an organic pattern look much better together than two different geometric patterns. Things like black and brown and gold and silver either consciously use both or try and stick to one. Whether or not you're matching your boots, belt and bag or earrings, necklace and rings can help a lot to either make things feel cohesive or mismatched. And finally, detail. The level of detail in the costume, whether you're going for clean minimalist lines or three or four trims and fabric treatments stacked on top of each other, is often the missing element in costume design. If you want your costume to appear intricate and rich, you can usually do this by using cheap materials gratuitously. Generously ruffle that lace, put decorative beads on your smocking, cover your foam armour in lace and spray paint it. Get 10 metres of the £5 fabric rather than 5 metres of the £10 fabric. Cartridge pleat till your heart's content. Have more of a train. Use all of the fabric that's left in the train. Get extra fabric for the train. Wear more jewellery. No, more than that. Put more braid on it. More braid than that. Use all the braid. Use all the braid you own. Sometimes though less is more and you want clean sleek lines or to let the shapes and the fabric speak for themselves. Or somewhere in between. It's up to you, but what matters is that you've thought about it. As long as you consciously make a decision about the level of trimming that you want, not just forgotten to think about putting trim on it, is going to make such a difference in how polished your costume looks at the end. This is also a good place to think about iconic details, such as a particular hairstyle, piece of jewellery, or marking that you're going to keep consistent across multiple designs, or that really sell that character as that character. If you're imitating or echoing an existing design, but changing some things about it, again, a good rule of thumb is to keep one or two the same and change the third one. So let's say you have a character with a very simple outfit in black and white. You might keep the shape and simplicity the same, but use a different colour. Or you might keep the colours and the simplicity the same, but update it to a modern fashion style. Or you might keep it in black and white and the same silhouette, but add lots and lots of extra detail to make an ultra luscious version of it. Finding that balance between consistency so it's recognisable and originality really helps at this stage in your design process. Now after all that, you've done it! You have a design for a costume! At this point, if you're so inclined, you might draw it out so you have one final image to look at. You might make a written description of what you're going to make, or you might just put all the images in one single place so you can easily look at your design and go, yes, this is my design. Congratulations! You have designed a costume. Now you just have to make it. Step five, execute. So this video is far too long already. And let's be honest, this step happening in real time is most of CosTube as it is. You can go and watch other people executing the making of a costume every day of the week. And as much as I would love to stand here and extol the virtues of Gantt charts, everyone's process is different. There are, however, two key pieces of advice that I think everyone can work into their execution process. Advice number one, be clear before you begin about what it is you're trying to achieve. I find it really helps to break stuff down into a list of component parts. So I'm not just trying to make an 1880s ensemble, but instead I have a list that says I'm going to make combinations, a corset, a petticoat, a bustle, a bodice and skirt, maybe a hat. It really helps me to establish what are essentials and what are nice to haves. I also find it helps me allocate my time so much better and provides a nice balance between achievable goals with a sense of satisfaction every time you complete a piece and making sure you're not getting too bogged down in one section of the project. And as for piece of advice number two, start now. Don't put it off. Don't wait until a mythical future time when you're suddenly better at things than you are now. Don't say to yourself, ah, oh, well, I can't do this until I'm good enough at X skill or Y technique or until I've done more things in this era. Just do it. Make the thing. The things you make are 100% better than the things that you imagined because they exist. That is the standard to which you need to hold yourself. The stuff you make has to exist for it to be valid. Anything more than existing is a perk. Make the thing. Do it now. Start now. Well, that was a marathon. I hope you're having a great convention weekend. Don't forget to check out the links in the description if you'd like to know more about what's going on this weekend. Obviously, I'd love it if you wanted to subscribe, like the video, drop a comment below, share this with your friends. But do feel free to stick around. I upload sometime. There's sometimes a schedule, but it's always a party. And I'd love to hear about what costumes you're working on, what designs you've got coming up, 
during the uh, longest of long darks and what other videos you've seen this weekend that you really really enjoyed. Have a wonderful co-covid weekend and I'll see you next time. I'm being a crazy cat dad again aren't I? Sometimes show up don't you? You don't you're not enjoying this. Seriously Thursday I'm trying to make you a star here. Hey puss. Hey, hey my love. How you doing? I'm good. That's okay I'm stealing the cat to oh, be really? in my video. Oh, okay. Because he's much beloved. <laughs> he's not enjoying it at all, but doesn't matter because he's not getting a choice, are you?